Welcome back. We are halfway through Plato's Republic. Here at the halfway mark, I want to do something a little bit different than I normally do. Uh, normally, when I'm halfway through a book, I like to give some kind of review, tell you what I like, tell you which characters are getting on my nerves. Um, but here, I don't want to really look at the characters because this is more, this is a, properly a book of philosophy, not a work of fiction. And I want to give you my esoteric reading of this book. So if you remember in the very first video, I said I'd be looking for kind of hidden meanings within the text. And I was tipped off to this idea by a really interesting book I read last year called Philosophy Between the Lines by Arthur Meltzer. And his thesis was that a lot of famous authors throughout history had ideas that were so dangerous they couldn't just come out and say them. They had to say the opposite of them, and they put little clues in the text to say that they meant the opposite of what they were saying. Um, I think The Republic is one of these books. And I'm going to make the case for that. And I didn't, you know, I hadn't read this in ages. Uh, I, I, I was kind of primed to look for these clues. Uh, but I, I think there is enough evidence there that maybe we shouldn't be taking Socrates at face value here. Uh, like a typical reader might in high school and like I did in high school. And so I'm going to walk you through the argument here. And I, I, it's going to involve most of the books one through five. This, this really clicked for me in book five. Um, so, so bear with me for a minute. So, the I'm going to first give you. I'm going to first want to try to convince you that Socrates might be trying to give us some kind of hint that things are not as they appear. Uh, and when Socrates was introduced, we had him referred to as Socrates with his usual irony. That was that was kind of a hint. We had another hint in Socrates' uh, refutation of one of the definitions of justice which I, I want to say Polemarchus had put forth that justice is helping your friends and harming your enemies. Socrates well, what if, says, what if you make an error? What if your friends are actually your enemies and your enemies are actually your friends? Or what if your friends are actually bad people and your enemies are actually good people? And Polemarchus didn't have a good response to that. So that, i.e., what if things are not, what, what if they're not as they seem? Another moment we had was Socrates also, I, th I think this is in book one or book two, uh, after saying something, making some um, incorrect argument, he said, so the person who says this would not be a wise man. I mean, he would not be telling the truth. That told me there might be a difference between being a wise man and telling the truth. We had another moment where, when he was summarizing some argument, he said, oh, so... The, for, the foregoing is not a complete lie. And Glaucon says, oh yes, of course, you're correct. That was kind of a weird phrase to use. He didn't say, oh, all the foregoing is correct. He said it's not a lie. A lie is a deception. Um, and so it's, it's kind of different from just being wrong. So he could have just said, oh, all the foregoing is not wrong. He said it's not a lie. So that, that seemed to, um, to me to be another hint that maybe there's some deliberate deception here. In his actual political philosophy, he introduces the lie. He has the noble lie, the magnificent myth, this uh, myth of the metals, that he's sort of reluctant to tell us, but then he says, okay, well, maybe we need a society that's grouped into three layers or three castes, and we want to kind of prevent mixing, except when we want to, like, take away a baby that's really skilled and bring him up to the the guardian class. And so he says, what we need to tell the people is that they're either made of gold, silver, or I think bronze or iron. And we tell them this myth about you know, kind of this metallic heritage that they have. And then we tell them that sometimes there's a gold baby born to silver parents. And so we need to take that gold baby away. And he says, that can be for the good of the city that you kind of have these highly skilled babies at the top of society and you have the parents uh, not being too upset about that because they just say, oh, well, you know, according to, the, according to the prophecy, this could happen sometimes. Aren't we lucky to have a golden child born? Uh, so that's, that's a hint. That's a big hint that there's deception going on because part of his ideal society involves deception. And he, this wasn't just an offhand story. It, it later comes back. He refers to the golden race at another point, and that becomes the justification in his ideal city for not letting the guardians own actual gold because they're told that they're made of spiritual gold and mortal gold and spiritual gold don't mix. So not, not to worry about uh, all the jewelry. So this is a very real myth 
in his ideal society. Um, so I think we have kind of enough clues there to think maybe not, not all is as it seems. Okay, and now, now I want to dive into this a little bit more, um, starting with that myth of the metals. And try to figure out if maybe that relates to anything else that we've seen in the book so far. Okay, so what is, what's the core concept of the myth of the metals? It's that you have these three groups of people, and they cannot intermix unless, in, except in cases where we uh, allow them to. We have another case of three things that aren't allowed to intermix or change jobs, as he said. And not just in the city, not just these three races of people, but if you remember Socrates gave his theory, remember, remember how he looked for justice in the city? Uh, he found he decided he, he had found temperaments and courage and wisdom, but he was still looking for justice. Um, and he he had a preliminary theory, and then he kind of went into this. He decided to look at the mirror image of the city and look at the individual in the soul. And the the way he found justice in the soul was he kind of reasoned about what the soul must be made of. He said there's a rational component, a spirited or angry component, and an appetitive component. And he said justice consists of the rational component and the spirited component becoming allies and keeping the appetites under control. And in particular, he says that these should not switch places. They should not change jobs. And that is, that is the essence of justice in the soul. And that also becomes the essence of justice in the city is not having these three things mixed. These, we have the complete guardians, the auxiliary guardians, and everybody else. So the complete guardians represent reason. The auxiliary guardians are the military. They represent spiritedness, uh, which kind of translates into spirit in battle. And then you have everybody else uh, who are kind of consumed by appetites. So this is, this is interesting. We now have two reasons why these three classes shouldn't mix. We have the myth this myth of the metals, um, and then we have this concept of justice. Now we're telling the people both of these things. We're telling them both the myth of the metals, and then we're telling them this idea of justice. So, and they're very closely related. They're like, if you look at them side by side, and he's told us to look at things side by side. He said we need to look at the human soul uh, side by side with the city. We need to look at the most evil man side by side with the most good man back in book one. Or the most unjust man next to the most uh, just man. If we look at these two things side by side, they look very similar. This myth of the metals and Socrates' definition of justice. So my esoteric reading here is that the noble lie in Socrates' society is this definition of justice that he gave, this very specific don't mix the three components definition of justice. That is, that's the lie. And what, is, what does this do? What, is, what problem does this solve? If we have everyone in society believing this lie about justice that, well, my, I've got my appetites under control by my rational element and my spirited element, and I live in the society where the same thing is happening. We have the rational elbow, you have the guardians keeping control of everybody else. What problem does that solve? Remember back in book one when Thrasymachus laid out his argument for uh, injustice? And Socrates had a rebuttal. So Thrasymachus had a very powerful argument that it was better to be unjust than just, or rather that justice was whatever is advantageous for the stronger. And then Glaucon and Adiamantus followed it up kind of making the case for injustice. Socrates gave a practical rebuttal to this. He said the problem if, with injustice is the city would fall apart. If everyone in the society knows that the society is unjust, they're not going to cooperate, they're going to descend into faction, and you're, you're going to kind of lose your city, or they'll, they'll lose in battle to a just city. Uh, and I pointed out at the time that maybe the solution to this would since he had already introduced the idea of deception, not knowing who your friends are, not knowing who your enemies are, maybe the solution to this is have the city, within the city, it believes itself to be just, but on the outside, it is extremely unjust. And so you get all the benefits of justice, i.e. this kind of esprit de corps, uh, preventing faction, and then he spends chapters and chapters talking about how he has arranged society 
not to fall down into faction. So he abolishes the, the family. You've got uh, th- this kind of widened definition of who your sons and daughters are, or who your fathers and mothers are. And a lot of it is done with an eye toward battle and uh, like fighting more valiantly because you're next to all your brothers and sisters. Like you don't just have one or two brothers or sisters um, or, or four in the case of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, so what is, what is he trying to achieve there with that? Is he, is he trying to create a just society by abolishing the family? Is that the end goal? Is the end goal to create that separation between the three elements with all these kind of extra proposals that he has here? I don't think they are at all. I don't, I don't think abolishing the family or this eugenics program or this like endorsement of infanticide or bringing your kids into battle. None of that is to promote a just society. What that all, all of that does is to promote a strong society. It's to have the most fierce warriors anywhere in the world. So that, I think we, we hit a real problem there. Um, that, or at least I think the solution is that Socrates is not advocating, this, this idea of justice that he's advocating is a, kind of a charade. And really, this ideal city is the strongest city. And everything is in service of strength, uh, just like Thrasymachus had argued for back in Book 2. And I, so that, that's, that's my reading of this. And Okay, so that, that shows you how we have these people on the inside believing that they're just. They're very strong warriors. You know, are they, are they doing injustice on the outside? Well, you remember the, the definition, or rather the justification for war in the first place. I think in book two, it was t- when he's building this ideal city from scratch, he says that we need, we're going to need guardians because we need to go to war with other cities because, anybody remember the reason? It's, it's not because we need, you know, bread and water. It's because we need to support luxurious li- living. We need the Attican pastries and the Corinthian prostitutes. Um, we need, you know, wine, we need feasts, and that's, that's ultimately the reason for getting the guardians in the first place. Okay, so it's, that's kind of the motivation for going to war. Now, you still might go to war and maybe in a just way, I guess. It's like, oh, you don't, you don't need all that extra stuff. We're just going to take that off your hands. Uh, But look at book five. I think this is kind of the final nail in the coffin. And I, I told you to look up the Melian Dialogue. Uh, which I, I said was written by Herodotus. It was actually written by Thucydides. Um, but it, it was an account of this, like, basically the Athenians becoming complete gangsters and uh, threatening another Greek island, saying, you need to submit to us or we're just going to, you know, rape and pillage and kill everybody. Um, and the Melians refuse to submit, and the Athenians just destroy the place. Uh, and so Socrates in book five had kind of extended passages saying how Greeks should not attack other Greeks like that. You can take one year worth of crops, but you shouldn't burn their houses down. Um, the Siege of Milos, I think, was in 416 BC. I just looked it up um, uh, yesterday after I made the video. So indeed, it happened before uh, the, the Republic was written. Um, so Socrates died in 399. I think the Republic was written like 20 years later. Uh, so, yeah, this was very much on people's minds still when Plato was writing. this Because this was basically the worst thing that they had ever, that a- Athens had ever done. <laughs> this, is, this is like the Iraq War of uh, Athenian democracy. And they were, they were all very ashamed of it uh, for, for decades and decades. Um, and, you know, maybe even to this day. Uh, so I, I think that was very, that was on his mind when he's writing this. And, but the way that he's written it, he says, he kind of provides this justification for, you've got the city, but then you have kind of the, like, Greek diaspora, and we need to kind of give them special treatment. Uh, And then it's the barbarians, you can do whatever you want to. So, although he's making, he seems to be making this argument almost about justice in treating other Greeks well, really I think it's about injustice. Um, the reason that he provides for treating Greeks well is that maybe you need to get along later, and essentially it's bad PR. So it comes down to not the reality of killing all these people or burning their houses down, uh, but rather the perception of it. 
And I, I talked in the last video about how people in the South are still a little bit mad about Sherman's march to the sea. I, I think Socrates was, was dead right, but I, I think the larger motivation here is not justice. It's, it's power. It's kind of soft. He's, he's essentially advocating for soft powers, and you need to treat Greeks well so that we do better in the long run. Like, it's better for us in the long run if we treat other Greeks well. Now, barbarians, we can do whatever we want to. We can burn their houses, we can take their women, we can enslave their men, uh, we can just kill their children. Whatever we want, it's completely fair game. Okay, so while he's def like defending kind of this honorable behavior toward other Greeks, he's at the same time defending uh, rather atrocious behavior toward barbarians. Um, and so that, to me, says that we're still left with this possibility where we can be as unjust as we want, as harsh as we want, to the enemy, to barbarians. And it's okay because, uh, first, we have this concept of justice where we tell ourselves that we're really, we're, we're the just people, we're the good people. And then, second, we have this kind of this ethnic argu argument, which hasn't really, that was the first place that that showed up, that said that we might almost want this, like, um, like single ethnicity uh, city state or or nation state. That, that's the the first time just like the Greek race uh, was mentioned in any way. Um, so yeah, and so I, you could start to s see this is might be sort of the intellectual foundation of the modern nation state, which is often like predominantly one ethnicity tied to a language, tied to a government, um, and kind of involving as many people as possible um, under, under that nation state so you get kind of the biggest economy that can, of people who can speak to each other. Uh, so yeah, so that, that brings us to kind of a dark place. We're now justifying all kinds of violence toward enemies. And if you remember, that at the very beginning, he told us why we should not accept that argument, like helping your friends and harming your enemies should not be accepted as justice because that makes your enemies less just. And that was the argument that ultimately persuaded Polemarchus. So how do we, how do we reconcile that, that argument made against Polemarchus with what's going on here by the end of book five? And I'm gonna offer, here's, here's my reading of this book. I think the first book, maybe the first two books, are, this is, this is almost a philosophical training book. And Socrates has given us the he's given us the counter arguments to books three through five in books one and two. So these these other definitions of justice, like oh you gotta give people what they're owed, and you need to help your friends and harm your enemies. I don't think he ever considered those to be legitimate ideas of justice, and they seemed like kind of weird digressions at the beginning. I think the real action in those books is the counter arguments to those definitions of justice. That's the ammunition that we need to attack this new society that Socrates has constructed. And I, so I, I think he's, he's really telling us how to do philosophy and how to argue back against this text. He's giving us the tools to disprove the text that he's laid forth as the truth. And that's, that's been the theme of all the Socratic dialogue. I think that's why this is in a dialogue form, to show you that these people, kind of Glaucon and company, are able to argue against Socrates, and then even kind of invent these other critics to argue against both of them. Uh, I think that was kind of a key turning point. You remember when he said, oh, well, you and I agree, but let's imagine a third critic who says these things. That's, that's where the reader comes in. That's when you're supposed to separate yourself from Glaucon. So in the first few books, you kind of feel like, like oh, Glaucon and I are on the same side. He's objecting to everything that I say, that, um, that I'm thinking. And eventually, he and Socrates kind of team up. And then we're left thinking, like, well, hold on. I don't, I don't agree with these two guys. Like, Gla Glaucon's not on my side anymore. And then they introduce this hypothetical third critic. I, I think that is the moment where he's trying to teach us how to how to do philosophy, how to divorce ourselves from this, these, tr like, Glaucon's kind of the training wheels, and we need to kind of get rid of Glaucon and philosophize for ourselves, and we need to be able to criticize the text for ourselves, and I, I think he's given us 
all he's given us the art he's even kind of put the arguments there for it like he's loaded up books one and two with arguments that we can later use so we've got ideas about uh, continuity of identity that will come up or at least i think will come up you know how your friend um lends you a gun and then wants it back but he's gone insane so you shouldn't give it back to him because now he's crazy and then we've got this idea that you might be mistaken about good and bad. You might be mistaken about who your friends are and who your enemies are. That idea has been pretty much absent from these later books. It's, I think it's one of the most important ideas that you can have, is that you don't really know the, the true nature of good people or bad people, so how is all this other stuff even possible? I, I think we're the ones who need to apply that argument and say, look, what you've kind of made people believe that they know the truth um, but that's purely for this militaristic end. Um, and yeah, so this is, and this, for me, this is, this is like, I feel like this is a special moment as I'm reading this book. Um, and also, also just being here on YouTube with, <laughs> with you, I don't think I would have read it this closely if I were just sitting, reading this on a Kindle silently, um, in a chair. And Socrates, in fact, or at least Plato's version of Socrates, argued against writing and said that I, I, one of, supposedly one of the reasons he said he never wrote anything was that he thought philosophy had to be spoken and there had to be a, a dialogue because the, a written text, uh, you can't really respond to it and it, it can't answer back. This, I think, is the closest we have to a, a, a sufficiently complex text where we can kind of talk back to it and then it can talk back to us if we kind of remember previous uh, argument. If we kind of go back through the books, look at all the arguments, and see how, how they're actually arrayed, and uh, whether they act, whether these things actually make sense or not, um, we can kind of reconstruct uh, a new dialogue that's that's sort of external to this text, uh, in kind of in the vein of these this Leo Strauss. Um, interpretation or sort of this this darker interpretation or esoteric interpretation that I'm giving you so okay that's that is that's my that's my interpretation here and he is he's basically constructing the strongest possible society justice is just used as a morale booster uh, I, I think he has a very cynical view of all of this 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 does bring me back to cephalus who left at the beginning I, I thought I thought from the time I met that guy, he was kind of the smartest guy. And now I'm even more inclined to think so, that he just sees these discussions of justice not going anywhere good. Uh, so the, what I'm really curious to see now is with this uh, philosopher king and where that fits in. Because it's a little weird that Socrates is just like, oh yeah, and I'm in charge. Um, he's kind of been the center of attention since the beginning of the Republic and kind of, kind of forced his, like, he, he just like took control. He's like, having this nice conversation with Cephalus, and he's like, oh yeah, justice, let's talk about the nature of justice. And Cephalus is like, I didn't really want to talk about that. That was your idea. I'm out of here. And Socrates doesn't say, oh, we, we can talk about something else then. He says, okay, like, see you later. I'm going to talk about justice with your son. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm curious where this philosopher king comes from, or, or where, where he's going, rather. He introduced it in an unusual way, or at least an unusual way for Socrates. Remember, he just gave this big speech advocating for it rather than kind of reaching it through this um, dialectical process or in, in clictic process or, or whatever it's called. Um, okay, so that is, that, that's kind of my, there you have my esoteric reading. I, I think this is a text that needs to be read esoterically and searched for, for hidden interpretations and meanings, and that there are enough clues to tip us off, and kind of a, enough, enough of an arsenal that we can take down the arguments that he's presented using uh, these ideas presented earlier in the book somewhat innocuously. Uh, so having said all that, um, I, I give this an A+. <laughs> Maybe I'm just giving my own interpretation of the book an A+, but The Republic gets an A+, from me. I think if I read this in high school and just took everything at face value, which I kind of did there, I just thought some stuff was, like, a lot of stuff was weird. Um, it's like, oh, here's just all these people exercising naked together. That's normal. Um, I, you know, I just kind of regarded it as a classic, but I don't, I don't think I was uh, really old enough to appreciate it, or I, I don't think I was exposed enough to enough other ideas to appreciate it. Um, 
as yeah something deeply psychological and multi-layered kind of reminds me of reading as uh, yeah so as for the rest of the book um I, you know I've, I've i've really enjoyed it kind of at a literary level i love how relatable it was to start just like oh yeah i was going down to the piraeus and ran into these guys and got hauled into this dinner conversation um I, I think that worked so much better than just starting with, say, the end of book five, where he's talking about the nature of being and the nature of knowledge and the nature of is and the nature of belief uh, in this really kind of abstract way. Um, and we've got pretty good characters, and he, he has kind of a sense of humor about his characters and, and just a sense of humor writing this book. Uh, so, you know, he's talking about, like, the nature... It's like, oh, yeah, and we're getting rid of actors who can have this multifarious nature where they can imitate lots of people... Like, well, wait a minute, like, Plato's writing in this multifarious way where he's imitating lots of different people. And that, that might be seen as another clue that it, maybe he's pulling our leg. Um, and then that very special moment where he's like, one of you earlier, I don't remember who, made the following objection. And that's kind of recognizing that these aren't real characters, they're just kind of different, ver like, different versions of the same character. Uh, Glaucon and Adiamantus and maybe Thrasymachus, too. Um, so yeah, I, I, I enjoy, not only Socrates seems to have a sense of humor about some of these things, but Plato seems to have a sense of humor as he's writing this. Uh, and he's done this in a very engaging way and kind of provided enough bait to make this interesting or just kind of prurient enough that like, people are like, oh dude, you gotta, you gotta read, you gotta read through book four. Like you gotta get to the naked people. You gotta get to like all the like sex that they're having. Um, so I could, I could see that he's constructed this in a way to get people to read it. Kind of like um, uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. He's like, well, let me tell you about my path getting to Christ. But first I want to tell you about how, like, how much partying I did with my best friend for like all these years and like all these women I was getting with. Uh, you can kind of see it as like trying to like appeal to these poor monks um, at a, a, a non-ecclesiastical level. Uh, yeah, so... Is I really wish I knew ancient Greek well enough to read this or at all uh, to understand uh, some of these terms. I'm sure it's much better in the original. Uh, but as I as I read this book and understand and interpret this book, um, all a lot of this stuff that seemed irrelevant at first seems to kind of have new meaning as I'm going through this. Uh, so I'm I'm liking it more and more as I go along. Even though that last part about the nature of knowledge I thought was extremely boring. Um, so. A plus for me, and let's conclude this halfway point review and get on to book six. Okay, Socrates' narration continues. Socrates. Okay, so you remember at the, at the end of the last part, he just finished talking about the nature of philosophy versus philodoxy, so having true knowledge versus having beliefs or false knowledge. And... Again, we don't actually know the, how you can tell the difference between those two people. His argument is that the philosopher sees the true nature of things. Like, if you have, if you have a lot of beautiful things, like the philodoxer is just kind of like a foodie. He's like, oh, I like this, and I like this, and I like this. And like, oh, yeah, you got to try the appetizer at this place. And then the philosopher understands kind of a, a beauty in the abstract uh, or good food in the abstract or whatever it is, like kind of understands the underlying elements there. Um, but, yeah, again, I don't know, if you, if you put, like, a philosopher next to a philodoxer in a room, like, at a party, I, I don't know how you tell one from the other. So ho hopefully Socrates will enlighten us. Okay. So who the philosophers are, then, Glaucon, and who they aren't has, through a somewhat lengthy argument and with much effort, somehow been made clear. Okay, so we know, we know how they're different in the abstract. In practice, good luck. Glaucon. That's probably because it could not easily have been done through a shorter one. Socrates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is kind of Glaucon taking Plato's side. Like, Glaucon used to be on our side. Like, man, Socrates, that was a really long argument. Why do you have to make it so long? But now he's, like, on Plato's side, being like, oh, yeah, definitely no way you could have shortened that, that one. Couldn't have made that chapter any shorter. I suppose not. Yet I, at least, think that the matter would have been made even clearer if we had had only that topic to discuss and not the many others that remain for us to explore 
if we are to discover the difference between the just life and the unjust one. Now, I, I thought, at least kind of superficially, he said we had already discovered the difference between the just life and the unjust one. The just one is the one in which the rational element and the spirited element keep the appetitive element under control. Like, that's what the just life is. The unjust life, you let your appetites uh, run the show. So I, I don't know why we're, we have to discover that again, but we'll, we'll see where he goes with this. Glaucon. What comes after this one, then? Socrates. What else but the one that comes next? <laughs> I guess that's a joke. Since the philosophers are the ones who are able to grasp what is always the same in all respects, while those who cannot, those who wander among the many things that vary in every sort of way, are not philosophers, which of the two should be leaders of, the, of a city? So he's kind of drawn this artificial distinction. He's like, yeah, there must be philosophers and there must be non-philosophers. Who do you want in charge? Well, all, all other things being equal, I imagine. Glaucon, what would be a reasonable answer for us to give? Socrates, whichever of them seems capable of guarding a city's laws and practices should be established as guardians. Now, I don't know if this is the complete guardians... Because we already, we've gotten to know these auxiliary guardians extremely well, like living in this military camp. Um, so I don't, I don't know where the philosophers fit in the hierarchy. Like the way I thought it was, was philosophers tell the poets what to say, the poets tell the guardians what to believe, and then the masses just kind of go about their business. Um, but I'm not sure. So well, so far he hasn't really fit this into the previous... Um, framework, although I, I, one possible way out of this was the reason he started talking about Philosopher Kings was he was saying what's kind of the minimum number of changes to the laws that we need to make uh, in order to get closer to the ideal city. Um, so maybe he's kind of skipping the military camps and these auxiliary guardians and just going straight to Philosopher King. I'm not sure, but maybe this will be clear. So, is the answer to the following question clear? Should a guardian who is going to keep watch over something be blind or keen-sighted? That's a leading question. Of course it is. Well, do you think there's any difference, then, between the blind and those who are really deprived of the knowledge of each thing that is and have no clear model of it in their souls, those who cannot look away, like painters, to what is most true, and cannot, by making constant reference to it and by studying it as, as exactly as possible, establish here on earth conventional norms concerning beautiful, just, or good things when they need to be established, or guard and preserve those that have been established. Man, okay, I'm going to go back through that. That's like an eight-line sentence there. I, I got a little bit lost, so we're going to slow down and do that again. Okay, so is there any difference between the blind people and those who are deprived of kind of true knowledge? So is there a difference between the blind and those who cannot look away like painters to what is most true and cannot by making con let's see okay so who cannot all right all right so what he's saying is the philosopher is like the painter the philosopher like sees the model or sees the landscape and is paint like keeps looking away to the truth and then kind of paints it over here and the guy who's not a philosopher like can't see the model so he's just like doodling from imagination I think that's what he's what he's saying and so that's that's the guy who can see he's the painter he's the philosopher he knows beautiful just and good things put him in charge already glaucon no by zeus there's not much difference between them socrates shall we appoint these blind people as our guardians then or those who know each thing that is have no less experience than the others and are not inferior to them in any other part of virtue Okay, do we put the blind people in charge? No. It would be absurd to choose anyone but philosophers, if indeed they are not inferior in these other things. For the very area in which they are superior is just about the greatest one. So <laughs> that's also kind of the trick. It's like, oh, should we put the philosophers in charge? It's like, yeah, they are good philosophers, but they're really socially awkward and can't balance a checkbook. Like, I don't know if we should actually put them in charge or not. But we're, we're assuming they're the same in every other way. Socrates, shouldn't we explain then how the same men can have both sets of qualities? Certainly, yeah. Tell me why your philosopher 
can do math. Then, as we were saying at the beginning of this discussion, it is first necessary to understand the nature of philosophers. And I think that if we can agree sufficiently about that, we will also agree that the same people can have both qualities and that they alone should be leaders in cities. Okay, convince me, Socrates. How so? And <laughs> this is not a great argument. Like, it just it assumes that there are no trade-offs. It's like, you need a philosopher, and surely they're not so bad in other ways. It's like, well, what if, like, what if there's only one philosopher in town and everybody hates him? Like, do we still <laughs> put him in charge? Like, where's, where's the trade-off here? Let's agree that philosophic natures always love the sort of learning that makes clear to them some feature of the being that always is and does not wander around between coming to be and decaying. Oh boy, we're kind of back in this abstract language here. Um, so I, I guess a philosopher sees what's eternal about something, not the things wandering around between the coming to be and decaying are just transient, essentially transient properties. Uh, okay, so what's... I don't know what's eternal about anything, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Glaucon. Yes, let's. Socrates. And further, let's agree that they all they love all of it and are not willing to give up any part, whether great or small, significant or insignificant, just like the honor lovers and passionate men we described before. Okay, so... love all of it so i guess love all of that learning so he's saying a true philosopher loves all kinds of learning and they won't they won't part with any subset of it just like those darn honor lovers glaucon that's right socrates consider next whether there is a further feature they must have in their nature if they're going to be the way we described what truthfulness that is to say, they must never willingly tolerate falsehood in any form. On the contrary, they must hate it and have a natural affection for the truth. Isn't this interesting? Here, I've just given you my esoteric reading about the importance of lies, and he's talked about the importance of lies and how the people in charge need to be making lies in order to tell the... Like, he was the one kind of scratching out lines from the poetry so that the guardians wouldn't be afraid of death, for example. And now he's saying, oh, but the philosophers love truth and they will not tolerate falsehood in any form. I, I, this seems like, <laughs> this I think is him lying somehow. So I'm not sure what the resolution is here, but we have a very clear contradiction between Socrates telling us in books 1 through 5 or 3 through 5 how important lies are. And now him saying, oh, and they should be in charge and they should hate falsehoods. I don't, I don't know how you get around this unless this is... More, more of Socrates' darn irony. Glaucon. They probably should have that feature. Socrates. Although, but this is, you see, this is how you get it past the censors. They're like, okay, I talked about how important lies are. Oh, but really, philosophers and truth, like, truth is the most important. We can all agree on that. And then, you know, the Pope's reading it or whatever. It's like, yeah, okay, that, that sounds good to me. He said truth is important. Next. Socrates, but it is not only probable, my friend, it is entirely necessary for a natu naturally passionate man to love everything akin to or related to the boys he loves. Love everything akin to or related to. Yeah, I, so we had kind of a reference to pederasty before with like the rose-colored glasses. And like, oh yeah, if you love a boy, you just think everything about him is beautiful. I think that's what he's getting to I don't know how this is related okay okay I think he's what he's saying here is just like this passionate man loves everything about his boys um, so the philosopher loves everything about learning I think that's what he's saying Glaucon that's right Socrates well could you find anything that is more intimately related to wisdom than truth? Of course not. Then is it possible for the same nature to be a philosopher, lover of wisdom, and a lover of falsehood? Certainly not. So, right from childhood, a genuine lover of learning must strive above all for truth of every kind. Absolutely. 
But in addition, when someone's appetites are strongly inclined in one direction, we surely know that they become more weakly inclined in the others, just like a stream that has been partly diverted into another channel. Okay, I think it's like, if you're really hungry for Taco Bell, you're not as interested in Pizza Hut or other pleasures of the flesh. Glaucon, of course. And when a person's desires flow toward learning and everything of that sort, they will be concerned, I imagine, with the pleasures that the soul experiences just by itself, and will be indifferent to those that come through the body, if indeed the person is not a counterfeit, but rather a true philosopher. Okay, so I, I think he's trying to prove why philosophers are going to be good people, like not actually not have any appetites because they just love learning so much. It's a nice idea. I could see how that would get past the censors. I don't know if that's, like, actually true. Um, but it is interesting. He, he introduces this distinction between the counterfeit and the true philosopher here. So we've got... Before we had, yeah, the philodoxer and the philosopher, but we, I didn't know how to distinguish them. And now he's presented this idea that maybe it is difficult to distinguish them. So we'll, we'll see how... If this distinction can be made in real life. Glaucon. That's entirely inevitable. Socrates. A person like that will be temperate then, and in no way a lover of money. What a good person. After all, money and the big expenditures that go along with it are sought for the sake of things that other people may take seriously, but that he does not. Glaucon, that's right. So here's an interesting, like, here, maybe here's the extension of this reading. So let's say we take the esoteric reading, that really it's the kind of the Thrasymachus definition here, that we need... We're, we're just trying to make the strongest possible society. All that really matters here is strength. And Socrates is sort of making himself the most important. He's making sell himself into a king. And maybe these are just more of his lies. Like, this is how he gets to be king. This is all kind of his big power play by Socrates. And he, the way he pulls it off, he's like, Oh, well, because I don't have appetites, and I'm not a lover of money. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't need all these things, but maybe they are deceptions. It, it was mentioned in book one, Socrates doesn't have any money. And uh, that just, that kind of came up in conversation somehow. Uh, but maybe, maybe this is his way of getting power is through, through these things, which we know, we already know are false. Like saying, oh, he loves only truth and not falsehoods. We know that's false. All this other stuff could also be false. Um... So, yeah, man, maybe this is just all all the way to get it. Like, this is just Socrates' like will to power in action. Um, I don't, I don't know. Keep going. But you do, you do kind of see throughout history, kings have to have mythologies about themselves so they they seem perfect. Socrates is doing the same thing, although people who, people who get up close are like, ah, I don't think all these things are true. <laughs> like all, all the things on the like North Korean website about. Kim Jong-un never defecating. That, that's, that's a true thing. Or a, a true lie. Look it up. Glaucon, that's right. Socrates. And of course, there's also this to consider when you are going to judge whether a nature is philosophic or not. What? You should not overlook its sharing in illiberality. For surely, petty-mindedness is altogether incompatible with that quality in a soul that is always reaching out to grasp all things as a whole, whether divine or human. Now that's that's a weird statement too, because I always feel like, you know, the devil's in the details, or you really need to understand the details in order to understand the thing as a whole. And Socrates' arguments often turn on small, seemingly small details. Um, on the other hand, he had, he had kind of denigrated specific knowledge before when he's talking about music education. He's like, oh, yeah, the, like, the sad harmony, what's that called? He's like, Mixolydian. Yeah, Mixolydian, band. Um, so, yeah, in, in my view, this, I think if, yeah, you kind of need a person to, to have that, you know, so-called petty-mindedness uh, to be a good philosopher. So I don't know if this is him pulling our leg more or this is him sort of justifying his own lack of knowledge about specific things or what and again this could just be him like it's like oh yeah Socrates doesn't know much about specifics but 
a, a good philosopher doesn't know much about specifics. Let's let's put the sales guy in charge. Glaucon. That's absolutely true. Socrates. And do you imagine that a thinker who is high-minded enough to, to look at all time and all being will consider human life to be a very great thing? Ooh. Yeah, we're... We just a small speck of dust, honey, in a small sliver of time. Glaucon, he couldn't possibly. Socrates, then he won't consider death to be a terrible thing, either, will he? Not in the least. Then a cowardly and illiberal nature could not partake, apparently, in true philosophy. Hmm. Okay, so the true philosopher is not afraid of death. I guess. And, I mean, Socrates didn't seem afraid. He's the one who drank the hemlock root. Glaucon, not in my opinion. Socrates, well then, is there any way that an orderly person who was not money-loving, illiberal, a lying imposter, or a coward could come to drive a hard bargain or be unjust? There is not. Okay, so this philosopher... He's not illiberal or money-loving, so therefore he's not going to be unjust. <laughs> I kind of want my leader to be able to drive a hard bargain. I don't know about you, but we'll, we'll let it pass. All right, Glockin, there's not. Socrates, moreover, when you are considering whether someone has a philosophic soul or not, you will consider whether he is just and gentle right from the time he is young or unsociable and savage. Of course. Now, this is strange just because we have we have these guys going to war with the barbarians and get, you got to be you got to be pretty stone cold uh, to be burning down the barbarians houses as he's kind of advocating in the previous book although i don't know maybe he just puts the general in charge of that glaucon of course and you won't ignore this either i imagine what whether he is a slow learner or a fast one or do you expect someone to love something sufficiently well when it pains him to do it and a lot of effort brings only a small return? No, it could not happen. What if he could retain nothing of what he learned because he was completely forgetful? Could he fail to be empty of knowledge? Of course not. Then if he is laboring in vain, don't you think that in the end he is bound to hate himself and what he is doing? Of course. So let's never include a person with a forgetful soul among those who are sufficiently philosophical. The one we look for should be good at remembering. Okay, it sounds a little bit like he's just enumerating his own personal qualities and just being like, oh, and that's the kind of king you want. Like, someone who's really good at learning, like, like really fast, not forgetful, that's me, and not petty-minded, doesn't care about details, sees the big picture, big picture kind of guy, that's who you want in charge? Glaucon, absolutely. Socrates, moreover, we would deny that an unmusical and graceless nature is drawn to anything besides what is disproportionate. Glaucon, of course. And do you think that truth is akin to what is disproportionate or what is proportionate? Glaucon, to what is proportionate. Now, isn't this interesting? So before we've related idea, uh, the idea of beauty with morality, and we kind of said that, like, oh, someone who's, like, well-spoken, I think this is in book four, three um is also like reflects a good character kind of a pernicious idea uh <laughs> you know most recently exhibited by fairly people on twitter calling ted bundy hot when the, the like the new netflix special came out they're like no like you're not allowed to call ted bundy hot okay it's like yeah but look at those high cheekbones uh and so now similarly he's relating truth to the proportionate um yeah, it's I'm I am uncomfortable with this idea. It's it was very popular for probably two thousand years, and I don't know. Maybe most famously put in that Keats poem that beauty's truth and truth beauty, all all ye know and all ye need know. I think it's kind of a dangerous idea because then beautiful thoughts can deceive us. Um, so I. <laughs> As I'm sitting here reading this, I'm just like, no, I don't... Like, it's cool when it is. Like, when you get a good equation, like, E equals MC squared, you're like, that's nice and... That's nice looking. That's nice and proportionate. That also happens to be true. 
that's that feels good. But sometimes you get these real big, messy equations that are not as famous, and there's just nothing you can do about it. Socrates. Then, in addition to those other things, let's look for a mind that has a natural sense of proportion and grace. One whose innate disposition makes it easy to lead to the form of each thing which is. Okay. Why not? Put, put the designers in charge. Glaucon, indeed. Socrates. Well then, do you think the properties we have gone through aren't interconnected, or that any of them is in any way unnecessary to a soul that is going to have a sufficiently complete grasp of what is? Glaucon. No, they are all absolutely necessary. Is there any criticism you can find, then, of a pursuit that a per person cannot practice adequately unless he is naturally good at remembering, quick to learn, high-minded, graceful, and a friend and relative of truth, justice, courage, and intemperance? Sorry, temperance, not intemperance. All wonderful qualities, Socrates. Not even Momus could criticize a pursuit like that. Yeah, just try to do that, Momus. Socrates. Well then, when people of this sort are in perfect condition because of their education and their stage of life, wouldn't you entrust the city to them alone? Okay, now, this, this idea definitely bothers me that truth and beauty are necessarily related, or that truth has anything to do with proportion. It is, it could be just another beautiful mythology, so it could be that the truth is sort of the esoteric interpretation of books one through five that the world is a horrible place it's just it's kind of might makes right survival of the fittest we're going to lie to the population in order to be the most effective warriors um to the outside world um and then but we tell ourselves that the most important thing is you know something being beautiful um so yeah i i don't know like it's it seems like it should do have more to do with with logic than like oh your my mind's just naturally drawn to proportionate and beautiful things. It's like well, okay, you know, that might make for a good Instagram account, but does that actually get any closer to the the truth of the world? I don't know. Okay, and Adiamantus replied. Okay, here's our here's our other guy piping up. Maybe he'll have an objection. Nope. <laughs> no one, Socrates, would be able to contradict these claims of yours. But all the same, here is pretty much the experience people have on any occasion on which they hear the sorts of things you are now saying. They think that because they are inexperienced in asking and answering questions, they are led astray a little bit by the argument at, at every question, and that when these little bits are added together at the end of the discussion, a great false step appears that is the opposite of what they said at the outset. Okay, I think this is exactly what Socrates was doing in, in the first two books. Um, where he's just like, well, you would agree with this, and you'd agree with this about a ship's captain, and a doctor would do this. And then by the end, they're like, ah, oh, no, you got me, Socrates. So I, I think it's the exact process he's describing here, that they like kind of come to resent it. Like the unskilled, who are trapped by the clever checkers player in the end, and cannot make a move. They too are trapped in the end, and have nothing to say in this different kind of checkers, which is played not with pieces, but with words. Yet they are not a bit more inclined to think what you claim is true. I say this in relation to the present case. You see, someone might well say now that he is unable to find the words to oppose you as you ask each of your questions. Yet, when it comes to facts rather than words, he sees that all of, all of those who take up philosophy... Not those who merely dabble in it, while still young, in order to complete their upbringing, and then drop it. But those who continue in it for a long time. It's like, yeah, not, not just the person who took an elective in college. The majority become cranks, not to say completely bad, while the ones who seem best are rendered useless to the city because of the pursuit you recommend. Okay. So, this guy's saying the guy is just getting trapped by logic all the time kind of hates the philosophers because they're like well most of you guys are just cranks and the rest of you are useless when i had heard him out i said so this, this is the case against philosophers do you think what these people say is false adiamantus i do not know but i would be glad to hear what you think socrates 
you would hear that they seem to me to be telling the truth. You would hear that they seem to be, seem to me that to be so they tell the truth. Kind of a weird, weird construction. Adiamantus. How then can it be right to say that there will be no end to evils in our cities until philosophers, people we agree to be useless to cities, rule in them? Yeah. You don't have you don't have the relevant skills. You can't drive a hard bargain. Socrates. The question you ask needs to be answered by means of an image. Adiamantus. And you, of course, are not used to speaking in images. I think that's sarcasm. Socrates. So... After landing me with a claim that is so difficult to establish, are you mocking me too? Anyway, listen to my image, and you will appreciate all the more how I have to strain to make up images. What the best philosophers experience in relation to cities is so difficult to bear that there is no single other experience like it. On the contrary, one must construct one's image and one's defense of these philosophers from many sources just as painters paint goat stags by combining the features of different things. Okay, what the best philosophers experience in relation to cities. I'm not sure. I don't know if it means they're persecuted by the city, which obviously Socrates was. I don't know if philosophizing about the city is the most difficult thing. Like, coming up with this really art, like, uh, either esoteric theory or, like, arcane mechanism, like, well, we're finding justice, but first we have to find in the city, then we find in the individual, then we go back to the city, uh, or, or what? Let's just say, I don't know what he's talking about yet. Imagine, then, that the following sort of thing happens, either on one ship or on many. Okay, we got a, a, a sh an image of a ship. The ship owner is taller and stronger than everyone else on board, but he's hard of hearing. He's a bit short-sighted, and his knowledge of seafaring is correspondingly deficient. Okay, we got a tall, strong, near, nearly deaf, and short-sighted ship owner. The sailors are quarreling with, the, with one another about captaincy. Each of them thinks that he should captain the ship, even though he has not yet learned the craft and cannot name his teacher or a time when he was learning it. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, put me in charge. Oh, I, want, I want to be in charge. I want to be in charge. Okay, so the, the ship owner is not, I guess the ship owner is picking a captain. Indeed, they go further and claim that it cannot be taught at all, and are even ready to cut to pieces anyone who says it can. Okay, so the ship owner's like, I need a captain. I do it myself, but I can't really see well. And they're like, ah, they're, we don't know. I'm like, I want to be captain. You can't, you can't learn that in school. I've been through the school of hard knocks, buddy. Graduated top of my class hate those Harvard guys. They're always crowding around the ship owner himself, pleading with him, and doing everything possible to get him to turn the rudder over to them. And sometimes, if they fail to persuade him and others succeed, they execute those others or throw them overboard. This is a pretty rowdy bunch here. So they're all saying, like, pick me to be captain, and if you pick someone else, they might just kill that guy. Then, having disabled their noble ship owner with Mandragora... This mandragora, an intoxicant, or drink, or in some other way, they rule the ship, use up its cargo drinking and feasting, and make the sort of voyage you would expect of such people. In addition, they praise anyone who is clever at persuading or forcing the ship owner to let them rule, calling him a sailor, a skilled captain, an expert about ships, while dismissing anyone else as good for nothing. They do not understand that a true captain must pay attention to the seasons of the year, the sky, the stars, the winds, and all that pertains to his craft if he is really going to be an expert at ruling a ship. As for how he is going to become captain of the ship, whether people want him to or not, they do not think it is possible to acquire the craft or practice of doing this at the same time as the craft of captaincy. When that is what is happening on board ship, don't you think that a true captain would be sure to be called a stargazer, a useless babbler, a good-for-nothing by those who shale in, sh in ships so governed? Okay. Okay, so he's, yeah, this is fascinating. He's saying kind of, this is kind of the difference between getting elected and governing. And, and But in this case, they don't get elected, they just kind of fight each other um, in order to become the, the captain of the ship. 
And this is this is basically the argument that the guy who's an actual expert in things who doesn't learn like how to fight um, is never going to be a captain. So they're just going to make fun of him. Like, oh come on, you you studying economics and tax policy, you're never you're not gonna, never going to get elected that way. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of true. Kind of a lot of relevance to today. Eddie Montes, I certainly do. Socrates, I do not think you need to examine the image to see resemblance, the resemblance to cities and how they're disposed toward true philosophers, but you already understand what I mean. Indeed, I do. Yeah, it's, it's not hard to figure this one out. This should be recognizable to anybody that the art of acquiring office is very different from the science of holding office. Socrates, first teach this image then to the person who is surprised that the philosophers are not honored in cities. And try to persuade him that it would be far more surprising if it were if they were honored. I will. Okay, isn't, isn't that really just where we all live on this like insane ship where all these rowdy people are trying to bump each other off and take power and feast? Ah me. World we live in. Socrates. Furthermore, try to persuade him that you are speaking the truth when you say that the best among the philosophers are useless to the masses. But tell them to blame their uselessness on those who do not make use of them, not on those good philosophers. You see, it's not natural for the captain to beg the sailors to be ruled by him, nor for the wise to knock at the doors of the rich. It's not natural. Okay, so I guess the true captain isn't going to be like, pick me, pick me, pick me. He's like, ah, get out of here, you darn stargazer. The man who came up with that bit of sophistry was lying. Okay, so the, the wise do not knock at the doors of the rich. Aristotle, in the rhetoric, says that when Simonides was asked whether it was better to be rich or wise, he said rich because the wise spend their time at the doors of the rich. <laughs> Sorry to say, saying that ain't true. But yeah, it is like, Thomas Edison is like, well, I could have learned math, or I could have just been an entrepreneur, and this way I can hire mathematicians. Like, they can't hire me. Okay. So, sorry is saying, no, the, the wise are not knocking the doors of the rich, the captain's not begging to be ruled. What is truly natural, and this, he did make this argument earlier, I don't know if it was book two, um, where he says, like, oh yeah, the, the, the best judge does not want to be judge, and he only becomes judge when he sees that nobody else can do the job. So it's kind of echoing, echoing that argument, I think. What is, truly nat what is truly natural is for the sick person, rich or poor, to go to, the, to doctor's doors, and for anyone who needs to be ruled to go to the doors of the one who can rule him. It is not for the ruler, if he is truly any use, to beg the subjects to accept his rule. Okay, yeah, same, same idea. It's like, he's, he, do he doesn't want it, or... Maybe he wants it, but the people have to come to him. Tell him he will make no mistake if he likens our present political rulers to the sailors we mentioned a moment ago, and those who are called useless stargazers by them to be the true ship's captains. Yeah, and this is kind of... This is, this is him engaging in persuasion. So this isn't reason. I think, I think there's a reason that he is using an image rather than pure logic. And we've seen it from the very beginning of the Republic... The way to persuade people is not through pure logic, it's through kind of appealing to their identity and, and through the use of images and analogies um, so that they come to see the current rulers as these darn sailors eating and drinking and then they come to see the philosopher as a ship captain rather than as a useless, useless stargazer. Adiamantus, that's absolutely right. For these reasons, then, and in these circumstances, it is not easy for the best pursuit to be highly honored by those whose pursuits are its very opposites. But by far the greatest and most serious slander is brought on philosophy by those who claim to practice it, the ones about whom the prosecutor of philosophy declares, as you put it, that the majority of those who take it up are completely bad, while the best ones are useless. And I admitted that what you said was true, didn't I? Okay, so the the worst slander is saying, yeah, you got a lot of, you got 
you got a few useless philosophers and just a lot of bad ones. Adiamantus, yes. And, yeah, for some reason Socrates agreed. Haven't we now explained why the good ones are useless? We certainly have. Or, oh, okay, why, why the good ones are thought of as useless. So now we got to talk about the bad ones. Do you next want us to discuss why it is inevitable that the greater number are bad, and try to show, if we can, that philosophy is not responsible for this either? Certainly. Again, this is... I don't... I don't see this as engaging in philosophy. This is more engaging in rhetoric um, with, with these images. So I, I think maybe the, the true philosophy is some of the stuff that we've done, some of the training that he's, he's given us, and then us engaging in and questioning the text. Okay, Adimanta, certainly. Now let's begin our dialogue by recalling the starting point of our description of the nature that someone must have if he is to become a fine and good person. First of all, if you remember, he was led by truth, and he had to follow it wholeheartedly and unequivocally, on pain of being a lying impostor with no share at all in true philosophy. That's, that's, that's quite a pain to suffer. That's what we said. Well, isn't that fact alone completely contrary to the belief currently held about him? It certainly is. So I guess... Uh, philosophers are maybe are thought of as sophists who are just doing all these things with falsehood. I think that's what he's getting at here, but I'm not sure. So, wouldn't it be reasonable then for us to plead in his defense that a real lover of learning naturally strives for what is? He does not linger over each of the many things that are to be are believed to be, but keeps on going without losing or lessening his passion until he grasps what the nature of each thing itself is with the part of his soul that is fitted to grasp a thing of that sort because of its kinship with it. Once he is drawn near to it, has intercourse with what really is, and has begotten understanding and truth, he knows, truly lives, is nourished, and, at that point but not before, is relieved from his labor pains. Okay, so he's got this natural love of learning... And he sees it all the way through the end, kind of with this childbirth metaphor. And maybe, maybe that's why he loves the truth, is because he, he, feel, he feels like he really earned it, gave birth to it. Nothing could be more reasonable. Well then, will a person of that sort love falsehood, or, in complete opposite fashion, will he hate it? He will hate it. And if truth led the way, one would never say, I imagine, that a chorus of evils could follow it. Okay. Yeah, and of course there's a difference between arriving at the truth yourself and what you tell other people. So he's saying, oh, I, I just hate falsehoods. Like, yeah, but you gotta, if you want to keep this ship running, you better learn to love it. Of course not. Did he just say that? Okay. Yeah, of course the truth is not followed. That a, Of course the evil is, is not following the truth. Which, again, that is, uh, he's kind of saying the opposite thing. Like, he's using the double negative construction again. Like, oh, we wouldn't say that. Everything I just said was a complete lie now, would we? It's like, well, hold, hold on. You're the first person who said anything about a complete lie. Like, you're the first person who said anything about a chorus of evils. I don't know. Maybe, maybe a chorus of evils does follow the truth. So it's sort of the, counter, the countervailing argument would be... Uh, to kind of this esoteric reading that was basically advocating for deception in order to support the stronger. Um, you could say, well, look, if, if you gave everybody the truth and they didn't have any myths, then society would just fall apart and would collapse. Um, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have all these nice things, these, these luxuries or maybe even some of the basics. Um, so may, I don't know, maybe that's, that's the chorus of evils. Socrates, on the contrary, it is followed by a healthy and just character and the temperance that accompanies it. Adiamantus, that's right. What need is there then to go back to the beginning and compel the rest of the philosophic nature's chorus to line up all over again? You surely remember that courage, high-mindedness, ease in learning, and a good memory all belong to the philosophers. 
Then, you objected that anyone would be compelled to agree with what we are saying, but that if he left the arguments aside and looked at the very people the argument is about, he would say that some of those he saw were useless, while the majority of them were thoroughly bad. Trying to discover the reason for this slander, we have arrived now at this question. Why are the majority bad? And that is why we have again taken up the nature of the true philosophers and defined what, is, what it necessarily has to be. That's right. What we now have to do is look at the ways this nature gets corrupted. How it gets completely destroyed in the majority of cases while a small number escape. The very ones that are called useless rather than bad. Okay, so he's saying philosophers, they're just good people, they're high-minded, they're not illiberal, um, they have courage and wisdom and all this stuff, but the bad ones give us a bad reputation because they lost their character. That leads the true philosopher to truth. After that, we must next look at those who imitate this nature and adopt its pursuit. We must see what natures, what natures the, soul have, the souls have that enter into a pursuit that is too valuable and too high for them. Souls that, by often striking, often striking false notes, give philosophy the reputation you said it has with everyone, everywhere. All right, so what's, what's corrupting these philosophers and making them bad philosophers and giving us a bad name? What sorts of corruption do you mean? I will try to explain them to you if I can. I imagine that everyone would agree with us about this. The sort of nature that possesses all the qualities we prescribed just now for the person who is going to be a complete philosopher is seldom found among human beings, and there will be few who possess it. Or don't you think so? Okay, yeah, all that, all that good stuff, high-minded, courageous, wise, that's, that's all pretty hard to find. I think we can all agree on that. Eddie Montes, I most certainly do. Consider, then, how many great sources of destruction there are for, the, for these few. What are they? The most surprising thing of all to hear is that each one of the things we praised in that nature tends to corrupt the soul that has it and drag it away from philosophy. I mean courage, temperance, and the other things we mentioned. Eddie Montes, that does sound strange. Hmm. Okay, well, see, what he's saying is these, like, each of these virtues kind of contains its opposite, or contains the seeds of its own destruction. I'm not, I'm not sure how that is, but I guess he's going to explain. Furthermore, in addition to those, all so-called good things also corrupt it and drag it away. Beauty, wealth, physical strength, powerful family connections in the city, and all that goes along with these. You understand the general pattern of the thing I mean? I do, and I would be glad to acquire a more precise understanding of it. Me too. Grasp the general principle correctly, and the matter will become clear to you, and what I said about it before won't seem so strange. What are you telling me to grasp? In the case of every seed or growing thing, whether plant or animal, we know that if it fails to get the food, climate, or location suitable for it, then the more vigorous it is, the more it is deficient in the qualities proper to it. For surely bad is more opposed to good than to not good. Okay, so yes, yeah, basically you're just toughening up a plant or animal by depriving it of what it, what it really needs. It's make, making it stronger with a, a tough childhood. Of course. So I suppose it is reasonable that the best nature comes off worse than an inferior one from unsuitable nurture. Okay, and it's similar to the argument about, he's like, well, we can't have people being too rich because then they'll get a little lazy and worse at their jobs. So what we really need is not wealth spread around, but full employment. Um, and same thing with, he was arguing about the other cities. He's like, oh, well, we'll do better than the rich cities because the rich cities are run by rich people. And they're not going to be very good soldiers, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna beat them. Don't worry. Don't you worry about that. Okay. So I think he's saying if you're growing up only with the good things, then maybe you'll just kind of get to be soft in that respect. Well, we'll see. Eddie Montes, it is. 
Socrates, well then, Adiamantus, won't we also say that if souls with the best natures get a bad education, they become exceptionally bad? Or do you think that great injustices and unalloyed evil originate in an inferior nature, rather than in a vigorous one that has been corrupted by its upbringing? Or that a weak nature is ever responsible for great good things or, or great bad ones? Okay, so we've got souls with the best nature, and they get a bad education. Does that make them worse than someone with, like, a reasonable, like, a normal nature? Or that great injustices in, originate in an inferior nature? Okay, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of nature versus nurture. Um, but he's like, which, which one's worse? Like, being born good and turning bad, or being kind of bad all along? Yeah, kind of... <laughs> So sort of the parable of the prodigal son. Eddie Mont says, no, you are right. So you are right that... Yeah, I guess it's usually the, the worst thing is the best nature that's corrupted, not something that's just always been inferior, because the inferior nature isn't like... It's kind of like Breaking Bad. It's like that, that guy's the worst guy of all. Like, when he turns into Heisenberg, that's even worse than just being a thug from the beginning because he can kind of like use all these powers he's developed for evil socrates well then if the nature we propose for the philosopher happens to receive the proper instruction i imagine it will inevitably grow to attain every virtue but if it's not sown planted and grown in a suitable environment here he is speaking in images again it will develop in entirely the opposite way unless some god comes to its aid. Or do you too believe, as the masses do, that some young people are corrupted by sophists, that there are sophists, private individuals, who corrupt them to a significant extent? Isn't it rather the very people who say this, who are the greatest sophists of all, who educate most effectively and produce young and old men and women of just the sort they want? Okay, so he's saying... All right, I'm going to go along with this bit about the masses... Some people who are corrupted by sophists. Isn't it the very people who say this? All right, we're getting a little, almost a little paradoxical. It's like, who's, who's the real sophist here? So is it, is it, are the youth being corrupted essentially by people like Socrates, or are the real corruptors the people who say that Socrates is bad? Or they're, they're the real sophists. I think. It's, it's, it's getting, getting a little bit convoluted here. I'll keep going. When do they do that? When many of them sit together in assemblies. And this, this might start to be Plato's commentary on the prosecution of Socrates, rather than anything Socrates actually talked about himself. Because, you know, he was, he was charged for corrupting the youth. When many of them sit together in assemblies, courts, theaters, army camps, or any other gathering of a majority in public, and, with a loud uproar, object excessively to some of the things that are said or done, then approve excessively of others, shouting and clapping. And when, in addition to these people themselves, the rocks and the surrounding space itself echo and redouble the uproar of their praise or blame. In a situation like that, how do you think, as the saying goes, a young man's heart is affected? How will whatever sort of private education he received hold up for him, and I get swept away by such praise and blame, and go be carried off by the flood wherever it goes, so that he will call the same things beautiful or ugly as these people, practice what they practice, and become like them. Okay, so we've got a young person, maybe who's educated by a philosopher, or maybe he's the future philosopher, in the suitable environment, and... When he sees the great majority of people saying, it, like, yay, sports, he also has his nature corrupted and is also thinking, yay, sports. Reek. Yeah, it's... And th this is always, this is, I guess, an eternal conflict. It's kind of like the education you receive from your parents versus the education and the values of the society at large. And are you just going to be swept away by the flood? Okay. The compulsion to do so will be enormous, Socrates. And yet, we have not mentioned the greatest compulsion of all. What is that? 
So this is, I guess these are kind of all the ways that you lose your true philosophical education. It is what these educators and sophists impose by their actions if their words fail to persuade. Or don't you know that they punish anyone who is not persuaded with disenfranchisement, fines, or death? Okay. So, yeah, I, I guess this is make this is why the philosophical education is so hard. you got these sophists who, first of all, kind of show you that the masses want something else, and also they will punish you for disagreeing with them. They most certainly do. Okay, I guess all of this is to explain why they're bad. There's so many bad philosophers. It's because, like, you get a philosophical education, but then society is just going to corrupt you. What other sophists, then, or what sort of private conversations do you think will oppose these and prove stronger? None, I imagine. No, indeed. Even to try would be very foolish. You see, there is not now, nor has been, nor ever will be, a character whose view of virtue goes contrary to the education these provide. I mean a human character, comrade. The divine, as the saying goes, is an exception to the rule. You may be sure that if anything is saved and turns out well in the political systems that exist now, you won't be mistaken in saying that divine providence saved it. So he's saying, it's, I think he's saying it's basically impossible to grow up and not be corrupted in the current society. That is what I think too. Well then, you should agree also to this. What? Each of those private wage earners, the ones these people call sophists and consider to be rivals in craft, teaches anything other than the convictions the masses hold when they are assembled together, and this he calls wisdom. It is just as if someone were learning the passions and appetites of a huge, strong beast that he is rearing, how to approach and handle it, when it is most difficult to deal with or most docile in what makes it so, what sounds it utters in either condition, and what tones of voice soothe or anger it. Okay, I think he's saying, yeah, these, so you got these private sophists who basically teach you how to, how to persuade. They're just like, all right, this'll, this'll get the masses every time. Just, just, just say, like, make Mexico pay, pay for the wall and the crowd will go wild. Okay, having learned all this through associating and spending time with the beast, he calls this wisdom gathers his information together as if it were a craft and starts to teach it. Knowing nothing in reality about which of these convictions or appetites is fine or shameful, good or bad, just or unjust, he uses all these terms in conformity with the great beast's beliefs, calling the things that enjoys good and the things that anger it bad. He has no other account to give of them, but he calls everything he is compelled to do just and fine, never having seen how much the natures of necessity and goodness really differ and being unable to explain it to anyone. Don't you think, by Zeus, that someone like that would make a strange educator? Okay, so I think he's saying, the Sophists are going around, they're just teaching you how to talk to a big group of people and make everybody angry or laugh or just, like, manipulate them. And then they confuse that with the, the truth and goodness. They're just like, yeah, this is all you need to know. This will persuade any crowd good enough. And Socrates is saying, no, no, no. True philosophy is this minority activity and has nothing to do with pleasing the masses. I think that's what he's saying. Adiamantus, I do indeed. Socrates, then does this person seem any different from the one who believes that wisdom is understanding the passions and pleasures of the masses, multifarious people, assembled together, whether in regard to painting, music, or politics for that matter? For if a person associates with the masses and exhibits his poetry or some other piece of craftsmanship to them, or his service to the city, and gives the mastery over him to any degree beyond what is unavoidable, he will be under Diomedian compulsion, as it is called, to produce the things of which he of which they approve. Okay, I'll check the note there. An inescapable compulsion, the origin is uncertain. Okay, so, yeah, you, if you do any of these things, you have to do the things, like if you're a painter... It's got to be kind of approved by the town council. Uh, Socrates kind of made similar rules for his ideal city. Remember, the craftsmen can only make things that are beautiful, and in order to only show beautiful things to people as they're growing up. So 
I don't, I don't know where that leaves us, except he seems to be, he's drawing a distinction kind of between the true and beautiful, accessible by the few, and whatever the mass is, like, kind of the pop culture and whatever they like. But that such things are truly good and beautiful, have you ever heard anyone presenting an argument for that conclusion that was not absolutely ridiculous? Yeah, yeah. It's like, is Britney Spears' music truly good and beautiful? Never heard anything more ridiculous. Eddie Montes, no, I do not suppose I ever will. So then, bearing all that in mind, recall our earlier question. Can the majority in any way tolerate or accept that the beautiful itself, as opposed to the many beautiful things, or each thing itself, as opposed to the corresponding many, exists? Okay, and again, that was the distinction he made at the end of book five. The philosophers kind of see the pattern among all the beautiful things, and then... The philodoxers only see the instances. And so can, can the majority accept that beauty itself exists? Not in the least, says Adi Montes. It is impossible, then, for the majority to be philosophic. It is impossible. And so those who practice philosophy are inevitably disparaged by them. Inevitably. And also by those private individuals who associate with the majority and want to please them. I think these are the sophists. Clearly. On the basis of these facts, then, do you see any way to preserve a philosophic nature and ensure that it will continue to practice philosophy and reach the end? Consider the question in light of what we have said before. We agree that ease in learning, a good memory, courage, and high-mindedness belong to the philosophic nature. Okay, uh, will he be able to continue? Yes. Right from the start, then, won't someone like that be first among the children and everything, especially if his, his body's nature matches that of his soul? Got to have that. Of course he will. So as he gets older, I imagine his family and fellow citizens will want to make use of him in connection with their own affairs. Okay, so we've got kind of the, the good kid born. He could be a future philosopher. And now what's going to happen to him? They're like, hey, you're good at everything. Why don't, why don't you run the, come run the family business? Certainly. They will get down on their knees, begging favors from him, and honoring him, flattering ahead of time the power that is going to be his, so as to secure it for themselves. That's usually what happens, at least. What do you think someone like that will do in such circumstances? Especially if he happens to be from a great city where he is rich and noble, and if he is good-looking and tall as well. Won't he be filled with an impractical expectation and think himself capable of managing the affairs, not only of the Greeks, but of the barbarians too? And won't he exalt himself to great heights as a result and be brimming with pretension and empty, senseless pride? Oh no, it's going to get to his head. He certainly will. Now suppose someone gently approaches a young man in that state of mind and tells him the truth, that he has no sense, although he needs it, and that it cannot be acquired unless he works like a slave to attain it. Do you think it will be easy for him to hear that message through the evils that surround him? Far from it. Yeah, that person just given everything. He's tall, good looking, smart. He's not going to work. He's not going to work for that PhD. And suppose that, because of his noble nature and his natural affinity for such arguments, he somehow sees the point and is turned around and drawn toward philosophy. So against all the odds, he's going to try to become a philosopher. What do we suppose those people will do if they believe that they are losing his services and companionship? Is there anything they won't do or say in his regard to prevent him from being persuaded? Or anything they won't do or say in regard to his persuader to prevent him from succeeding, whether it is in private plots or public court cases? Yeah, don't let him become a philosopher! No! There certainly is not. Then is there any chance that such a person will practice philosophy? None at all. Do you see, then, that we weren't wrong to say that when a philosophic nature is badly brought up, its very components, together with the other so-called goods such as wealth and every provision of that sort, are somehow the cause of its falling away from the pursuit? Yeah, this is kind of a corrupting uh, influence of wealth has come up a number of times in this book. Um, from, like, the rich city being kind of too fat to fight, uh, to the potters becoming bad potters, or maybe turning to revolution if they have too much money. Um, yeah, we gotta, gotta kind of stay lean and mean. 
No, we were not. What we said was right. There you are, then, you amazing fellow. That is the extent of the sort of destruction and corruption that the nature best suited for the noblest pursuit undergoes. And such a nature is a rare occurrence anyway, we claim. Moreover, men who possess it are the ones that do the worst things to cities and individuals, and also, if they happen to be swept that way by the current, the greatest good. For a petty nature never does anything great, either to a private individual or a city. <laughs> he really hates these petty natures. That's very true. So when these men, for whom philosophy is most appropriate, fall away from her, they leave her desolate and unwed, and themselves selves lead a life that is inappropriate and untrue. Then others who are unworthy of her come to her as an orphan bereft of kinsmen and shame her. They are the ones responsible for the reproaches that you say are cast upon philosophy by her detractors, that some of her consorts are useless while the majority deserve many evils. Well, what made you a philosopher, Socrates? How did you escape? Huh? Oh, I guess he explained before. He's, he's the guy who's just considered useless. So this is his explanation as to why most are bad. Yes, that is what they say. And it is a reasonable thing to say. For other worthless little men see that this position has become vacant, even though it is brimming with fine accolades and pretensions, and, like prisoners escaping from jail who take refuge in a temple, leap gladly from their crafts to philosophy. They're like, I can be a philosopher! These are the ones who are most sophisticated at their own petty craft. You see, at least in comparison to other crafts and even in its present state, philosophy still has a grander reputation. And that is what many people are aiming at, people with defective natures, whose souls are as cramped and spoiled by their menial tasks as their bodies are warped by their crafts and occupations. Isn't that inevitably what happens? It certainly is. Okay, so what he's saying is it's the, the reason that the philosophers are bad is because the good ones all left or got all like they're so good at everything they got talked out of philosophy and that that leaves open some positions for philosophers and then these just kind of other con artists show up eddie montes it certainly is do you think that they look any different than a little bald-headed blacksmith who has come into some money and newly released from debtor's prison has taken a bath this is such a specific image i love it put on a new cloak, got himself up as a bridegroom, and is about to marry the master's daughter because she is poor and abandoned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're no different at all. What a great image. Oh, man, that is so good. It's like, yeah, I d don't worry about my jail time, prison time. I'm, I'm reformed. What sort of offspring are they likely to beget then? Won't their children be wretched illegitimates? Inevitably... What about when men who are unworthy of education approach philosophy and associate with her in a way unworthy of her? What kind of thoughts and beliefs are we are we to say they beget? Get more kind of sexual childbirth imagery. Won't they be what are truly and appropriately called sophisms, since they have nothing genuine or truly wise about them? Absolutely. Then there remains, Adiamantus, only a very small group who associate with philosophy in a way that is worthy of her. A noble and well-brought-up character, perhaps, kept down by exile, who stays true to his nature and remains with philosophy because there is no one to corrupt him. Or a great soul living in a small city who disdains the city's affairs and looks beyond them. A very few might perhaps come to philosophy from other crafts that they rightly despise because they have good natures. And some might be held back by the bridle that restrains our friend, friend Theages. You see, he meets all the other conditions needed to make him fall away from philosophy, but his physical illness keeps him out of politics and prevents it. Finally, my own case is hardly worth mentioning. My demonic sign. Since I don't suppose it has happened to anyone else or, or to only a few before. Okay, I'm going to look this up. His demonic sign. Explains his... Uh, okay, we got to see Plato's apology. Whatever. Now, those who have become members of this little group have tasted how sweet and blessed a possession philosophy is. At the same time, they have also seen the insanity of the masses and realized that there is nothing healthy, so to speak, in public affairs, and that there is no ally with whose aid the champion of justice can survive. That instead he would perish before he could profit either their city or his friends and be useless both to himself and to others, like a man who has fallen among wild animals and is neither willing to join them in doing injustice nor sufficiently strong to oppose the general savagery alone. 
Taking all this into his calculations, he keeps quiet and does his own work, like someone who takes refuge under a little wall from a storm of dust or hail driven by the wind. Seeing others filled with lawlessness, the philosopher is satisfied if he can somehow lead his present life pure of injustice and impious acts and depart from it with good hope, blameless, and content. Okay. So he's saying, he's I guess he's the kind of guy who just saw how crazy the world was and just kind of kept in his little sphere of knowledge and nurtured it and just wants to live this blameless life. Kind of, kind of interesting. You sort of read about those people sometimes, or maybe that's, that's how people get really good at things. They're just like, ah, oh, there's too much going on here. I don't want to enter. I don't want to go into business or politics. I'm just going to focus on this little thing, like my physics or my music or whatever, and then <laughs> sometimes come up with the great stuff. Adiamantus. Well, that is no small thing for him to have accomplished before departing. I'm going to go back. So his accomplishments here live, lead his life pure of injustice and impious act and depart with it with good hope, blameless, and content. I'm reminded of Cephalus again here. He's the guy who's about to depart life, and I, I think he meets those qualifications as well, or those characteristics. And that's the no small thing to accomplish. Oh, well... <laughs> But no very great one either, since he did not chance upon a suitable constitution. And a suitable one, so constitution I think means the political context. And a suitable one, his own growth will be fuller and he will save the community as well as himself. Anyway, it seems to me that we have now said enough about the slander brought against philosophy and why it is unjust. Unless, of course, you have got something to add. Adiamantus, I have nothing further to add on that issue. But which of our present constitutions do you think is suitable for philosophy? Okay, I'm going to stop right there since we kind of reached the end of the thread of thought and the sun's about to go beyond the horizon. Um, okay, end of the first half of book six here. Uh, hope you're enjoying it so far. Um, yeah, he Socrates here just lays out what the true philosopher is like and why these philosophers don't seem to have a very good reputation um, and starts to speak kind of imagistically. So he's got this big example with the ship captain explaining why philosophers are considered to be useless because they're like, they're not good at like persuading the ship owner or like bullying the ship owner into making them captain. Um, and then he's talking about why all these other philosophers are bad. Basically, the good ones get corrupted. Uh, along the way, he talks about some other stuff, um, talking about why, uh, like, the ship's... The true captain needs to be begged by the people to be the captain, why he's not, like, going out and and uh, seeking it for himself. Um, so, yeah, we got kind of the philosopher... These, this nature of the true philosopher <clears throat> loves truth, has all these virtues... Uh, seems to be an all-around great guy, but again, I don't I don't know what the truth is here because he just spent the last five books explaining why the philosophers kind of need to tell lies to the people in order to create this just society, or at least this society which perceives itself uh, to be just. Uh, so this has gone on long enough. I will leave it at that as far as the recap goes, um, and because yeah, I ta talked way too much at the beginning. Um, so, hope you come back and see us sometime. Come back tomorrow. I will finish up book six and see exactly where this is going with the, how this philosopher king is going to come to power, uh, if he's going to come to power, and what his, what his real agenda is, maybe. So, hope you're enjoying it. Hit the old subscribe button, uh, if you have not already. Hit the like button on this video, and see you tomorrow.